Have you ever tried to get your head around just how game studios like Hello Games managed to create a game so damn big like No Man's Sky that is the size of a literal universe that contains over 250 galaxies and 18 quintillion planets? Or how about how Mojang Studios managed to create a virtually infinite game world which gives you the freedom to do whatever the hell you want in Minecraft? The answer is, of course, procedural generation. But how exactly does procedural generation work? Well, it is an incredibly complex tool that is becoming more widely used in the video game industry and beyond. And in this video, I'm going to explain just how it works, well, in layman's terms, and how these game studios and others are able to create such vast game worlds. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get stuck in. And you might be thinking initially, well, how on earth is this random YouTuber going to explain something so damn complex when they're just, well, a YouTuber who creates videos for video games. And that would be a fair concern, but outside of YouTube and in my day to day job, I'm in fact a software developer who has had some experience dabbling in procedural generation. So hopefully I can explain this incredibly complex development methodology in a fairly easy to understand kind of way. So the definition of procedural generation involves creating data or in gaming's terms, this could be terrain, graphics, 3D models, using a series of human generated algorithms and computer generated randomness, as opposed to manually generating game worlds. In video games, it can be used to create vast game worlds automatically and depending on the implementation, it could give you a completely unique gameplay environment, the likes of which you can see in Minecraft, or it can be exactly the same for every player, like you can see in No Man's Sky. But how do both of these actually work? Now, both of these games will use numbers called seeds, but they can be implemented in different ways, so let's start with No Man's Sky. Now, in computing terms, nothing is truly random, though it may seem it that way to you and me. If you were to get a computer to roll a dice, we would expect the outcome to be totally random, but computers use something known as pseudo-random generators. And what this is basically means a computer will start with a number, uh, the seed, and then do a bunch of math and that number over and over again to spit out as many numbers as it wants, and it will then give us the outcome, which may seem totally random, but not so much to a computer. But if you started with the same seed number each time and did the same math on that number, you would be getting the exact same outcome every time, which is how we can see the same planets at the same locations in the game. Now in No Man's Sky terms, that means Hello Games feed the algorithms the same numbers every time, you're going to get the exact same world over and over again. And that is how players in No Man's Sky see the same planets in the same places in every galaxy. So if I was to give you the coordinates for planet in the starter galaxy No Man's Sky, it would look exactly the same for you as it does for me. Buildings would be in the same place, the flora and fauna would be the same, the terrain would be the same, and even player created bases would be the same. Now take Minecraft as another gaming example. This allows players to specify a map seed to generate certain game worlds, which are near infinite in size. And assuming a player inputs the same seed number into the generator, whilst running it against the same version of the map algorithm as any other player, Again, the outcome is going to be the same. There are websites and Reddit threads all over the place specifying Minecraft map seeds along with the version of the game they're playing, so to generate specific terrains to include anything from like ancient cities and islands to vast mountain ranges and complex caves, and all you need is that initial seed number to get this exact map. The principle is the same in both games. Lob a seed number into the algorithm, it will perform a series of complex math operations to give you an outcome. But in Minecraft, you can do this by yourself, but in No Man's Sky, Hello Games have kept that under wraps, so everything is the same for everyone regardless. But how do these seed numbers actually generate terrain for us to explore? The answer to that is Perlin noise, which is a type of gradient noise developed by Ken Perlin way back in the 1980s, and it has a number of uses, but for this video, we're only going to be talking about it in terms of terrain generation in video games. Now, games will use Perlin noise to create all sorts of things like natural rolling hills, and then you can add methods to it to say things like, above a certain height add snow, 
or below a certain height, add stone, or even lower, add water or grass, or whatever. It's really complex, but I'll try and explain it like I'm five, how this actually works. Now, Perlin noise is most commonly implemented as a two, three, or four dimensional function, but it can be defined for any number of dimensions if you so desired. When you're creating game terrain using Perling noise, it'll take three steps. Step one is defining a grid of random gradient vectors with arrows pointing away from its corners. And it sort of looks a little bit like this diagram. Step two is computing a dot product between the gradient vectors and their offsets, which results in a structure noise. And then it looks a little bit like this diagram. The final step is interpolating it, and that is effectively smoothing out those values to give a more gradual feel. And the result of all of this is Perlin noise, and from that, we can then create terrain that looks realistic. So think of looking at this graph as though you're looking down directly onto a Minecraft map, where say the green parts are hills and the purple parts are valleys. I would also go out on a limb and suggest Hello Games are doing something kind of similar, for their new game Light No Fire because in the trailer you can see huge rolling hills and seriously varied terrain and doing that on a single planet the literal size of our earth is nigh on impossible without using a technique such as this. But to sum all of that up, procedural generation uses algorithms and techniques to create game data like terrain, graphics, 3D models, maps, caves and pretty much everything in between. And it can be used to create near infinite size games, the likes you can see in No Man's Sky and Minecraft. But those games can be totally different from the games where everything is created manually and scripted. I know obviously No Man's Sky planets use procedural generation, but this must be one of the extremes because this planet that you're seeing right now is probably the most mountainous planet that I have ever come across in the game, like in six years of playing. I've seen some with pretty big mountains, but none that have me falling so far for so long. I don't know what they did with this seed number, but it's hella cool, I think. So what are some of the main differences between video games using these techniques, so like procedural generation, purling noise versus the ones built, let's say manually? Well, the first and probably most obvious one and that I've alluded to already is the size of the game. Like if you've got a team of developers and designers building a game map, you know, like Red Dead Redemption 2, Cyberpunk, Grand Theft Auto, all that sort of thing, it's going to be a significantly smaller map than a procedurally generated one. See No Man's Sky and Minecraft size as an example. But whilst these maps are smaller, there feels like there is significantly more crammed into them. Take Cyberpunk 2077 as an example. Night City and the surrounding area isn't a big map by any stretch of the imagination. Hell, it's, it's even fairly small by today's open world map sizes that were created without using procedural generation, but it is absolutely jam packed full of stuff with so much to do and so many things going on. You can walk around literally any corner and expect to see some event going on like a mugging, a fight, a shoot up. A vast array of other things. I mean, what a great and happy, positive place Night City is. But you get the point. The world feels truly alive and it doesn't need to be any bigger than it already is. The flip side of this would be No Man's Sky, which probably contains the biggest game world ever made, or more accurately, Game Universe. Now, there are other examples alongside No Man's Sky with similar sizes. Well, maybe not quite similar size, but like Elite Dangerous, or as I've mentioned a few times, Minecraft which have significantly utilized procedural generation. Get these insane sizes, but size isn't everything because these game worlds are significantly less dense and there's a lot less going on, even though they're so damn big. And even though say No Man's Sky has a very strong community of players, myself included by the way, it does feel empty and repetitive quite a lot of the time, a sentiment that a lot of gamers would actually agree with. And that sort of brings me nicely onto what are the pros and cons of procedural generation used in video games. And I'll start off with the good stuff. The first one is, if done correctly, the game studios can save so much time, work, and ultimately cost 
with the overall design of the game by doing this. Like, just look at the size of Minecraft and No Man's Sky, and then look at the size of the teams who built them. Those teams are significantly smaller than any AAA games that come out these days. Another advantage would be replay value. Levels can be totally random or randomly generated, like Minecraft, and players would never ever get bored of it. It's probably how Minecraft is, or well, not how, but one of the reasons why Minecraft is probably the best selling game of all time. You can generate a map in the game using a seed number or generate ones from seed numbers you find online, and it can create a truly random game world for you like that. Then there is No Man's Sky with its infinite universe offering players unlimited exploration potential over 18 quintillion planets. And finally, have you noticed how the install size of these fecking huge games is much, much smaller than the likes of, say, Call of Duty? Though maybe that's not a bad example because it dwarfs nearly all other video games for reasons unknown. But the point still stands. Content get loads in, sorry, gets loaded in as you discover it, meaning the file size of these games is significantly smaller. Now onto the flip sides of procedural generation, and as I've alluded to already in this video, the games tend to be less detailed and feel a little bit more, say, empty than games that have been built from the ground up manually. You know, like I said, your Red Dead Redemption, your Grand Theft Auto, Cyberpunk, The Witcher, and so on. These games are insanely detailed and beautiful games with so much content shoved into them, and you just don't get that with a procedurally generated game. Sure, their size can't be beaten, but when it comes to adding depth and more detail, that's where they begin to falter a little bit. And less depth often means more repetitive gameplay loops. So again, take No Man's Sky as an example. Yes, you can explore this universe in its entirety, but you'll end up doing the same things over and over again. You can visit a planet, scan some creatures, explore a little, find some buildings, perhaps create a base, mine some resources, and so on. Then once you've done that, you go to another planet and do the same thing over and over again. The quests and the story are small and don't really offer any depth. But the flip side is, you don't play a game like No Man's Sky for its story. You play it to explore its planet, so in that case, it was very successful and it works really well. Now, if game studios become too ambitious with procedural generation, players can get bored very quickly. Again, see No Man's Sky Day 1 release as a prime example. Sure, there was an infinite universe to explore, but absolutely feck all to do in it. Though they have been making that right ever since then with many, many major updates, and it is a far better game now than it was back then. It also makes it more difficult to script events like you can see in other games, which isn't necessarily a bad thing in some cases, but it can be because it doesn't give the universe like a more alive feeling in No Man's Sky, for example. Like, it just doesn't feel alive to me. Whereas Cyberpunk definitely does. Procedural generation can lead to some weird or random things that you'd never find in a manually created game, for example. Like in Minecraft, you could have a desert area slapped right next to a tundra or a snow area, which just doesn't even seem remotely realistic, even in gaming terms. And I think this may also be one of the reasons why No Man's Sky Planets have a single biome across the entire thing, as opposed to multiple biomes. But Hello Games' next game, Light No Fire, well, that's soon going to change, so we're going to see just how well they get on with that. Let's hope we don't find a desert next to a snowy climate. And finally, as you may have expected, games that utilize procedural generation significantly can be more taxing on hardware, even though their install size is smaller. It's why you start to see games like No Man's Sky either crashing or just performing pretty damn badly on older consoles when you're visiting, say, a large base, for example, or in the middle of a freighter battle. They just can't perform as well anymore because the, it's just too taxing on it. But when it comes to personal preference over games that use a significant amount of procedural generation versus ones that either don't use it or just use it for a very little amount, say stats generation for weapons and shit, I don't really have a preference. I thoroughly enjoy games that fall into either category and it just depends what I fancy playing at the time. But enough of what I like, what type of game do you guys prefer, if any at all? 
and let me know if this video gave you a little bit better understanding on procedural generation and how that actually works. But also, if you have any questions around the subject, please leave a comment below and I'll do my best to help answer them. And there you have it folks, there is an overview of the absolutely mind-blowing tech behind games like No Man's Sky and Minecraft which use procedural generation extensively. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it taught you something new and if you are still here it would be totally awesome if you could support my channel by hitting those like and subscribe buttons. You can now become a channel member as well and as always thank you for watching this video and I hope to catch you in the next one.